This is a Bentz Patton Motorwagen from 1886, or a replica of one anyway. And this is a Ford Model T Touring from 1918. This one is not a replica. Hi, cooking a factory meal is easy. All you need is a dedicated 60 watt cabinet CO2 laser to house your microwave. This video is brought to you by Factor, ready to heat meals delivered straight to your door. Preparing your Factor meal is as easy as choosing your meal, in my case, pork tenderloin and cheesy cabbage, sliding off the cardboard cover, stabbing the film to vent it, and sticking it in the microwave for two minutes. Factor meals are always as delicious as they are easy, but don't take it from me, take it from my dog. She doesn't have much to say about Factor because she doesn't speak English, but isn't she cute? With Factor, you get a large variety of meal options, again, delivered straight to your door. I usually go with the chef's choice, but there's also keto, calorie smart, and vegetarian options if you so prefer. I've had several people ask me off camera, hey Robert, is Factor actually good? I know you work with them, but is it actually good? And yes, my family subscribes to Factor, I subscribe to Factor, and a whole host of other people I know subscribe to Factor. And the universal consensus is, it's delicious. So you should get it. Have you tried Factor yet? If not, why not? Go to factor75.com and use code AsianWheels50 at checkout for 50% off your first box. You won't regret it. Thanks again to Factor for sponsoring this video. Now back to really old cars. This is a replica of an 1886 Benz Patent Motorwagen. Is it the first car? No, this one was built in the 1980s. But also the Patent Motorwagen was not the first car either. The actual first car, if you can call it that, was a steam-powered carriage contraption built by a Frenchman in 1769. This came more than a hundred years later. Going down this horrifying ramp, pulling back on the lever, he said just coast down this. Okay. <laughs> there was also an internal combustion engine automobile powered by hydrogen that was built in the early 1800s by a Swiss person. This isn't the first car, but what it is, is the first internal combustion engine personal mobility automobile that was patented, produced, and sold. Many think of this as the first car, but I have to imagine the reason for that is because of Mercedes-Benz marketing division. Sitting up this high on this thing is quite terrifying, and there's nothing to stop me from tumbling over that way except a spear right in the middle of my body. Well, I guess if there were two people up here, it would be to the side of my body, which is controls. This won't take long. There is a handbrake over here. Pull all the way back for a brake on the differential. Push forward, and it slips the drive belt from the idler pulley to the drive pulley. That's it. There's no throttle on this thing. There's this valve down here that controls the fuel air mixture and right above that turns the ignition on and off. It's just a screw and it opens a contact when it's all the way screwed in. And steering is a tiller. I would like to point out something about this too. This is a rack. This is a pinion. The first ever car, asterisk, 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 has rack and pinion steering. Yes, it's a steering tiller, but it has rack and pinion steering. That's too fast. Let's pull back on the brake. Turn this way with the rack and pinion steering. Let's start with the controls and work our way back. Like I said, this knob here controls the fuel air mixture and on the back side of this, behind this panel, you can very clearly see how this works. Unscrew this knob and you expose the holes that air flows into. This is all it's doing to adjust the air fuel mixture. <laughs> this is like 10 miles an hour, I'm guessing. And this right here, that's your distributor. This is what causes the sparky spark. Front wheel, nothing to it. No suspension, all you have is your rack and pinion steering tiller. Rear suspension is a beam axle on full elliptical carriage leaf springs, and as you can see, it is chain drive. The drive bar is up there, and it does have a differential. The differential is open. No, not like that. I mean, it has an open differential. There's no case on it. You can see the spider gears. Let's go forward a little bit, make this turn, hit a bump. Not too bad. This lever is multifunction. Like I said, you pull back on it, that is your brake. Brake is singular. And pull forward on it, and that puts you in drive. What happens when you pull back on it is it rotates this shaft down here, which applies pressure to a band wrapped around the drum of the differential. You see, it's essentially a transmission brake. 
When you push forward on this lever, it's not so simple. This linear motion is translated to another linear motion through a very ornate looking set of brass bevel gears that then to take a pawl that is on either side of the drive belt and moves it from the free spinning idler pulley over to the drive pulley. And that slipping is sort of the clutch in this thing. And when you're going up hills, you gotta kind of pump it. That's your speed control. The complexity of the drive system in this thing frankly astounded me. I fully expected the first ever car asterisk 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 to have like one wheel drive or something to mitigate the need for a differential, but no, it has a proper differential and a single speed transmission with no reverse, but it has a proper differential. So strange not having a throttle, just a stationary engine that I'm engaging and disengaging with a single speed transmission and a belt. This is a stationary engine adapted to a non-stationary application. This is definitely not an ideal situation for this engine to be in. It has a single set speed, no throttle, but they made it work. Through torturing of this belt and through slipping it all the time, they made it work. Does it work very well? No, not at all. It barely moves the car forward on the slightest of grades. And I suspect if these weren't the lowest rolling resistance tires in existence, this thing would not be able to move itself forward. This is quite a steep hill for this very underpowered engine. Pull back on the lever. The engine's bogging down a little bit. Operating RPM is about 250 RPM. And unlike any modern engine, I can show you how all of it works because it's all exposed. It has a total loss oiling system like a Subaru. This is very obviously your flywheel. Crankshaft, counterbalance, connecting rod, and up through here you can see the bottom of the piston. This I believe is an oiler. I think this is also an oil. Yes, my finger's covered in oil from touching it, so that means it's an oiler. I believe this is an oiler. Bevel gears that translate the motion 90 degrees to the big drive pulley here. More oilers up here. This is the cam for the ignition timing. This is the cam for the exhaust valve. And then connected here is the rod for the sleeve intake valve. It has a poppet exhaust valve, but a sleeve intake valve. This is the fuel tank, but it's not the main fuel tank. You open a valve on the bottom of this to let fuel go into the main fuel reservoir, which I'll show you in a second. By the way, there were no gas stations in 1886. In the day, they would have run this off benzene or whatever explodey liquid they could find at the hardware store. Now, the museum runs this off camp fuel or white gas, which is similar to kerosene. <laughs> oh, that's, that's way too fast. Let's pull back on it. Later patent motor wagons had carburetors, but this is a replica of a number one, which did not have a carburetor. It, well, I guess you could call it a carburetor. It has a surface carburetor or an evaporative carburetor and an evaporative intake system. It's that big tank in front of the fuel reservoir. Your running fuel sits at the bottom of this tank and this tank is full of, I had it described to me as a steel wool like material to increase the surface to allow that fuel to evaporate. Air comes in through the front here and what goes into the intake of the engine is evaporated fuel that is metered out with that air fuel knob that you have access to as the driver. And this is your cool, ah, that's still warm. <laughs> that's your coolant reservoir. <laughs> One lap to go before it starts kind of overheating. You can see where the coolant flow connects to the cylinder right here. That's one part of the water jacket and this pipe also goes down for another part of the water jacket. It's a thermosiphon cooling system, no pumps or anything like that. Top speed is about 10 miles per hour, which on this contraption is terrifying and the horsepower output of this engine is almost one. All right, let's see if we can make it up this hill. This is the new challenge. Engine's bogging down quite a bit, quite a bit. Can I make it? Can I make it? I think, no, no, let, we're abandoning that. They say the number one engine, which this is a replica of, produced about 500 watts, half a kilowatt, which is about two thirds of a horsepower. The number two increased power to somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 horsepower, and the number three had as much as two horsepower, which doesn't sound like a lot, because it isn't, but that's more than double what this one makes. Let, let the engine speed up again. Let's give it a second. There we go. Apparently, Benz and Company produced about 25 of these things, although the sources I read were conflicting on that. And they originally sold for 600 Deutschmarks, which I tried to adjust for inflation, but the number I ended up with was $6,200 equivalent today, which seems 
way too low. Even though this isn't the first car, it's surprising to me that it took until 1886 for someone to patent this configuration of automobile. To put that year into perspective, the US Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869, more than 10 years before this was patented. Moving forward a few decades, we have another first car, the Ford Model T. Driving the Model T. This shows your handbrake lever back here, all the way back pulls on the drum brakes on the rear axle. Halfway down, is neutral and then all the way down allows free gear movement of this pedal right here. The pedal on the left all the way down is low gear in the middle somewhere which when you put the handbrake lever in its middle position you can kind of see that pedal depressing a little bit. That's neutral and then the pedal all the way up is high gear. Like I said it's a two-speed gearbox. The middle pedal that is the reversed gear. This clamps the brake band for the reversed gear. And this is your transmission brake, the pedal all the way on the right that is so nicely labeled B for newbies like me. And there's two levers on the steering wheel. This one is your throttle, there is no foot throttle. And this one is your manual advance and retard for the ignition timing. Hold the brake, just keep my foot where it is. Yep. Drop down on the pedal. We're in neutral. Off the brake. Pop it into high gear. Boom. All right. I did a gear shift. <laughs> I'd like to apologize in advance to the Model T aficionados out there. I learned everything I know about the Model T yesterday, so please forgive me. Up until the age of about 10, I thought the Model T was the first car, which in retrospect, of course, an American child thought Ford invented the car. But of course, this was not the first car, nor was it even the first Ford. That was the Quadricycle, not dissimilar to the Benz Patent Motorwagen. And there were a few more Ford models between the Quadricycle and the Model T. The only thing the Model T was the first of was car to be produced on an assembly line. What is the top speed? About 40, something like that? Uh, um... Yeah, I mean, a well set up Model T, you're going to be between 40 and 45 mile an hour. Production of the Model T started in 1908 and went all the way until 1927, at which point this design was absolutely ancient and needed replacement. 15 million Model Ts were produced in factories all over the world, from Argentina to Germany to the UK to Canada, and of course, factories all across the US. Child me was wrong in thinking this was the first car, but for millions of people all across the world, this kinda was the first car. There were many different variations of Ford. They were all called the Model T. This specific one is from 1918 and it's the Touring variation with, I was gonna say four seats and four doors, but more accurately it would be described as two rows of seating and three doors. I am uh, delaying the inevitable of come bringing this thing to a stop. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> crankshaft bearings, what kind are they? I assume they're not pressurized oil bearings. No, no, you've got uh, Babbitt bearings. Quick side note, you know that often quoted line from Henry Ford, you could have your Model T in any color you want as long as it's black? That came later. From the start of production to 1913, the Model T was available in four colors, none of which were black. And my understanding is later on in production, it became available in multiple colors again. The move to only black paint was one of many cost reduction measures that was implemented as production went on. As production went on, the price of these things dropped. By the end of production in 1927, the unit price of these was about half of where they started in 1908. This 1918 Model T would have cost about $500 new, which is the equivalent of about $10,000 today. And by the end of production, prices dropped down to almost $300. Here's the pedal. I, yep, bring your speed up a little bit. Go ahead and pull back. Oh, I brought it to a stop. Anyway, I am not qualified to give you a history lesson. My research process does involve Wikipedia, but I am qualified to show you the car. Lots of engineering progress happened between the Benz Pot and Motorwagen and this. The Benz has one cylinder. This has four. The Benz has almost one horsepower. This has 20. The oil is contained in this engine, mostly. This has four wheels and all of them have suspension. Still no dampers yet, but they have suspension. The tires have air in them. It has lighting of some form with kerosene lamps up here for backup. All right, we shall try reverse now. There you go. Oh, wow. It has more than just a transmission brake. Barely. It has a parking brake in the form of mechanical drums on the rear axle. 
nothing in the front. It has a wheel instead of a steering tiller, although it does not have rack and pinion steering. It has a planetary gearbox here at the top of the column that translates steering motion down to a pitman arm that moves the wheels to and fro. And something I just noticed, with the vehicle stationary, if I move the wheel back and forth, the entire body shifts left to right. I don't know if you can see that on camera. <laughs> Quite flexible, the Model T. We should, we did a gear shift. That's way too fast. I mentioned it has three doors, not four. It looks like it has four doors, but this is not a door. Possibly they did this to save on production costs, but most likely the reason there is not a door here is because the handbrake lever is right here as well as all the pedals. It would be very difficult to get in and out using this door if it existed. Engine is a 2.9 liter four cylinder making about 20 horsepower cooling. It doesn't have a water pump. It is a thermosiphal cooling system. This is the radiator that you're looking at in the front here. Originally it would have had magneto ignition, but now it's been upgraded to something a little more modern with a battery. Compared to the Benz, this is a massive technological advancement. You can't see the underside of the piston because it's enclosed. And of course the engine is started with this crank on the front that is spring loaded to pop it out of the crankshaft with these ramp teeth so that when you engage it and when the engine starts it will just pop out. That wasn't it. Hey! Two things I was told about this crank starter. One, always grab it with your thumb underneath because of those ramp teeth that that engine backfires, runs backward for even a second, you will break your thumb and your hand will never be the same. And also, sometimes it's not even all that necessary. If you get the engine into the right position and turn the ignition on, sometimes it will just start. Oh. The transmission is a two-speed with reverse. You may be familiar with the concept of an automated manual transmission. For instance, the transmission in the original Smart 4.2 was an automated manual. It was a manual style transmission with the clutch, but the clutch and the gear shifting was all controlled by actuators. You didn't do any of it yourself. The transmission in this is the exact opposite. This has a two-speed planetary gearbox. It is the style of an automatic transmission, but without the automatic part. You can think of it as a manulated automatic. With an automatic transmission, there are brake bands inside there that clamp on ring gears, causing your gear shifts. In this, there is not a solenoid actuating those brake bands. You're doing it yourself with levers. Although the Model T gearbox doesn't have ring gears, the brake bands act on drums connected to one of the three sun gears, which mesh with the three planetary triple gears. The flywheel is the planet carrier. High gear is direct drive and is connected via a clutch at the back of the gearbox. That clutch is disengaged when you pull back on the handbrake or when you push down on the far left pedal. That's why the middle position on the pedal is neutral. It's pushed down far enough to disengage the high gear clutch, but not far enough to engage the low gear brake band. Sirens are blaring. They're coming after me. I'm speeding in my Model T. Let's go over the controls. I've already shown you the driving control, so here's the key to turn the ignition on and off. As far as gauges go, there is one. It doesn't currently work, but there is one. It is an amp gauge over here, nothing else. There's a knob right here and a little pull lever down here. The pull lever is your choke. There's also one sticking through the radiator in the front so you can yank on the choke while you're cranking the engine over and the knob adjusts your fuel air mixture. It just goes straight down to the carburetor and twists a valve on the top of the carburetor. Front suspension is a solid beam with a transverse leaf spring. Rear suspension is a live axle with, I guess you'd call it two half transverse leaf springs. I hesitate, hesitate to say I'm getting better at this because that's when I'll screw something up. Rear doors on this touring variant are rear hinged and the front door is front hinged. The suspension on this thing was meant for two things, durability and pre-road days. It's very carriage soft. And that's it really, I just wanted to give you a cursory look at these two firsts in the car world. Let's be honest though, I film these videos mostly for me so I can experience these two magnificent machines and drive them around. Even if it was briefly, it was an incredible experience. And thanks to the Lane Motor Museum in Nashville, Tennessee for having me out here to film these videos. This, this place is my spiritual home.